Okay, here we go. We are recording. Um, welcome, welcome everyone. Let's get the chest out of the way. Um, welcome everyone to um, session eight, I think, of the Back to the Cell study course that we're doing in preparation to resume our training in the cells of Emma in 2021, which cannot come soon enough. Um, in this uh, in this little course, I'm taking everybody through, at least at the beginning of it, because I'm not exactly sure how long it's going to last. Um, in this uh, beginning of this course, we're going to take a saunter through the Getty, uh, and we're going to be looking at um, as many plays as we can, taking note of um, big concepts and other things that we might not necessarily get to see when we're on the cell floor, if we weren't actively reading and referring to the manuscript. Um, we're also putting it on video as well, so that it's going to be there forevermore, I suppose, so we can refer to it from whatever is useful from these sessions. Um, please continue to ask any questions and make any comments that you have as we go through. Um, I very, very highly encourage you to engage in the, in the text um, as we're taking it, not least because chances are if you have a question through other people, for other people have it as well. So it's good to ask. And last but not least, um, the little disclaimer. Obviously, I am the one mainly taking you guys through the Getty in this course. So you're going to be getting my views. Uh, and my views are just one of many. There are many instructors at Emma, and there are many scholars at Emma. And uh, nothing is the case just because I said it. I want you to be convinced by the same evidence that I'm convinced by as opposed to, or um, for thinking something is X or something is Y. All right, so um, we've made it all the way to the sixth Remedy Master, which is yeah. pretty exciting. Yep, so Aaron, somebody have a question? Just, yep. Yeah, before we start, like nice. I, I uh, caught up on the recording, which yeah, they've been very helpful. Uh, but I wanted to check about like the whole idea of the fifth Remedy Master. Yes. Uh, like the previous Remedy Master is like, the Masters like, does something, but huh. it seems to me that in the, the fifth one, like, the situation is like they're passive like it, the all the the scholars then are how to get out of the situation but what is the master actually doing in the main page of the fifth remedy master okay great question and um this also allows me to do what i should have said right away which is um ask or open the floor to any questions uh that have come from the previous material so we'll deal with um your question first alex so what is the fifth master actually doing so first of all um just to note um, the fifth master, unlike every other master, the fifth master is not dealing with a blow, or rather, they're not dealing with a specific blow or set of blows. They're dealing with a, an abrazari situation with the threat of a blow incumbent in it. Um, there's a collar grab or some kind of shoulder grab, and the enemy has a dagger and it's free, or at least that's what the context appears to be in the um, in the photo. So where, whereas the, the master, the remedy master of each of the other dagger uh, sections, the remedy master would be doing a cover. Okay, they would be, you know, doing cover. Strictly speaking, this situation is not a cover. Okay, so that's, that's note number one. Note number two, though, is that there is an action, I believe, in the text of the master. Okay, so let's look at the fifth remedy master first. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so he says, I can mess up his arm. Before he attacks me, I can mess up his arm since the way he holds me actually gives me a great advantage. I can do all the uh, stuff that the other remedy ma are of the other remedy masters, and there's a proverb. So, okay, so it's true he's not explicitly showing a play here. That's true in the text, okay? However, and obviously this, we reflect on this this perennial picture question, how much do the pictures actually matter? What are they telling us, et cetera, et cetera? There is a play later on, which is almost identical to the master, which is this one, I think, eighth scholar, yeah. And also the first counter is similar to what the master, uh, what the master is doing. So there's there's four plays I want to draw your attention to. First, the master, right? If pictures mean anything, first the master with his, we see his hands and what the what the setup is like. That's folio 38 R D. Okay. Then we have 
the eighth scholar, folio 15RD, okay, and then we have the counter, folio 15VD, so all these guys' hands are in a similar position, and then finally we have the first scholar of grappling, of Abrazari, which is, oh, no, 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 which is 6VA, okay, folio 6VA. So it's my contention that what's being shown in the master is probably first, it's probably something like what's shown in 15RD, which is um, if I give you a turn to this arm, I will surely place you in a um, low bind or a strong key. And I, he says I can also do other stuff. Okay. So if we're going to look at the closest proximate piece of information, I think it's, uh, this is the first place I would look. He's, he, he's probably doing a lower key or something like that. However, it's notable that in the picture, his hand is grasping the elbow, right? And again, if pictures mean anything, that's notable. Whereas in the master, his hand is above the elbow, noted, right? In the counter, his hand is above the elbow, noted, right? And in the first remedy master of dagger, 6VA, his hand is above the elbow. So there's another argument you could make, and this actually, I think, more bears out the evidence personally, that the play that the fifth master is doing here is actually probably the first, uh, the play of the first master, or the, the first master of, uh, of grappling. Which is this arm? Which is this arm bar? Okay. Now you might ask. Finally, well, the first master of grappling, this play here, the arm is blocking a blow or blocking the other arm or whatever. Yeah, sure. Who cares? It would be even better if this arm was grasping the the collar grab, securing that arm there, right? As a matter of fact, in class, in recruit in recruit class, without having to block a blow, I think that's what you should be doing. I think that you should be attempting to secure this arm to your shoulder so that you can uh, do this uh, this this first master play. And it works much better than just using your one arm where he could let go if he wanted. So that's that's my theory, right? Although um, I was wrong, I guess, in that I, I thought the text actually explicitly said a play. And it it doesn't. Per se, it doesn't. It says I can mess up his arm. Oh yeah, that's the final bit of evidence. I can mess up his arm. I mean, does a lower key mess up his arm? Uh, I don't know, maybe. But I know what messes up his arm. This is a straight arm bar. That damn sure messes up his arm. So I think I think it's the first. All oh, that's to say, I think it's this one. But isn't the straight arm bar like one of the options in the eighth scholar? Um, it. Let's, let's read that again. Um, I surely. So the eighth scholar says. Low binder, strong key, the play is even sure in armor. I could do other things to you, keeping my... So it isn't, no. Um, in the eighth scholar, he says, keeping uh, it, um, doing a low binder, strong key, or by keeping my left hand where it is and grabbing under the left knee with my right hand, I won't lack the strength to put you under the ground, which is sort of referencing something more like uh, folio 38 VC, something more like this, right? However... Dagger is messy. If this fails, could you read the first play of grappling into it? Yeah, sure. Why not? I don't. I, I wouldn't quibble on that. So I pointed all this stuff out just to show that I think it's all very similar stuff. I don't think it has to be necessarily one thing or the other. But with all of this said, I don't think it's a mystery per se what's going on uh, here. I know that's not what the, the, that wasn't the word you used, Alex, but it's going to be something like that. Lower key, first play of grappling, you know, and again, if the first play of grappling, we know from the Abrazar section, if the armbar fails, he can go right into the third play, right? So maybe third play, uh, the third play of Abrazari as well, a folio six VC. So one of those. Uh, it makes sense. I, I don't, I don't want to keep dwelling on it. Like the, yeah, no, no. the, the, the whole class, it's just that, um, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, the previous masters, it's mm -hmm. like I do the cover and then I do all this other stuff. Whereas the play that you just described, sure. you can't do like do that and then bring your arms in the cross, like in the second uh, scholar. Like, you can't, uh, like, doing the play that you just suggested yeah. seems to preclude some of the scholars from being carried out. Well, uh, 
insofar as choosing one action to do precludes the ones you didn't do, maybe. But like I, I don't think this is like again. This this is just a this is a picture. It's 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 a picture. It's not a a, a photo. So you know it doesn't necessarily preclude it, right? We don't know the timing of this situation, right? As we, I was talking with Bruce earlier, and this is again, an, an, it's good to bring up. We don't know the timing context of this. So we don't know how much time this guy has to try stuff. You know, maybe he hasn't even drawn his dagger out yet. So he tries the arm bar, but then he draws his dagger, so he switches to this play. Right? Maybe he already has his dagger out. Okay, then maybe there's no time to chew, to, to do other things. So maybe, yes, this does preclude some of the other scholars in the mere act of doing, right? Because you can only do one thing at a time. You know, you'd have to know the yeah, context. Makes of. sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, there, it, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'd say. Does anybody else have any questions or comments about anything that we've st uh, covered so far? By the by, yes, no. Okay, cool. All right. Um, thanks for that question. That's good. That's very good. Um, all right. So um, the six of today, we're going to launch into the sixth remedy master of dagger, and I've been pretty excited to get to this point because um, we're this is the start of the dagger on dagger section. Okay, of the of the uh, of the dagger section, the sixth remedy master, the seventh, and the eighth are all of our dagger on dagger plays, where the defender actually has a dagger, which is pretty cool. Um, so, right off the bat, I want to look at two broad concepts. I want to kind of compare the covers without the dagger and the covers with the dagger, and I want to note some similarities and some differences. Okay, and the scholars, uh, the last scholar session we had really helped me suss this out. Um, so thank you very much, scholars, for that. So first things first. So the dagger on dagger section. So here, given this person is trying to murder the other, right, or trying to kill the other, the fact that the other person has a dagger is significantly different from if the if the defender is unarmed the defender unarmed we, we've seen so many great counters right um and we've seen how difficult it is for the, the unarmed defender to actually get it done right and it's difficult as hell this situation is different in a in that you know yes you're still being attacked by the dagger but the covers you have available are they're better, I think. I don't want to be too qualitative about it, but they're a little, you could you can be a little more confident about it. You can make the covers a little more farther away, I guess. And you have an object with which to lever the thing that you've covered. So, and not only that, but you have an object to take the force of the blow, right? Whether or not you're doubled and crossed or um, doubled, you're not taking the blow on your hands or on your wrists or on your arms, right? So um, that's great. Um, and of course, not only that, but you have a dagger yourself. So whatever the dagger person can do to you, you can also do to them. Um, which is not something that you can say about the, the, the man who is unarmed. So it's much more of an even situation, okay? Number one, it's much more of an even situation. Um, off the bat, before we even get into the engagement, okay? Number two. Number two is the timing issue, okay? Or the timing, I don't know, paradox or whatever. So, you know, unarmed versus unarmed, sword versus sword, spear versus spear, polex versus polex, um, you know, uh, long weapon versus short weapon, the long, you know, the if you're equal or the, you have the weapon is longer, you have the advantage, right? You have the advantage. But with short weapons, specifically short weapons, like probably messers, not longest messers, but probably like messers, big knives and, and daggers, the, the timing advantage accrues to the defender by virtue of the fact that the shorter, shorter weapons are typically not able to fully cover the arm that's wielding them, right? 
and um, and oftentimes weapons like big knives and these daggers or whatever, maybe they're as big as the forearm that you're holding it with. Maybe they're a little bigger. But the shorter weapons, you need to actually step in to hit your opponent, right? You need to actually step in to hit them. If they're unarmed, then there's little risk in in a in in you know, in uh, good attacks, right? Obviously, they can defend and whatever, but you have your offhand. You know your art, assuming that you know what you're doing and they do. The risk is fairly modest, right? There's lots of interesting covers and, and responses and double ups and things you can do. So um, you're, you're just at an advantage, right? When the other person has a short weapon as well, the attacker is arguably at a significant disadvantage, in the same way, or in a similar way, I would say more so, but in a similar way as the attacker in uh, with the longer weapons, the attacker often has a disadvantage in that they have to bring their body to you, they're, have, they're crossing the space to you, and you're not obligated to do the same in order to make a defense. Your defense, the actions that you need to remediate the killing blow can be significantly more modest than the attack whereas in, in contrast against the, the the main attack when you're unarmed the actions you um you're going to take against the dagger are, are going to be you know you're not you you don't want to move too much but you're not going to be moving super modestly either right you're going to be aggressively moving into the um, path of the attack. You're going to be blocking it. You're going to be ripping the dagger away and doing your adversary and fighting like hell to survive. So with this short weapon on short weapon situation, we're going to start to see some of the different contexts that weapons fighting actually creates in a way that we haven't seen before in the manuscript. Okay. Now with dagger on dagger, dagger on dagger is um, is curious because you know, once the attacker, assuming the attacker is trying to murder you, right? Once the attacker tries to tries to murder you and you block the attack, you know, you you can block the attack and continue on, get a hold of their dagger, do other things. As the defender, you have an opportunity to do things to their dagger and to the opponent that the opponent doesn't have to you to do to you, right? They can attack. They can maybe free their attack and break off but not much else right there's no provocations in dagger per se right and pro the concept of provocations is something we're going to get to in the sword section and i can't wait for that but provocations being you know there's no way for you to break your opponent's guard with the dagger except by doing like kind of chicken-esque pecking shit that is dumb and you shouldn't react to, right? All of you know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. You know, waving the point of the dagger in front of your opponent's face, you know, doing little stutter steps or, you know, stamping the ground or other nonsense like that. If you know what you're doing and if you have some training, that stuff is not relevant, right? They're either going to attack you or they're not going to. And remember, again, this this is why this is difficult to train or when we train, we have to put parameters because, you know, oftentimes when we do this in class, we have a situation where it's it seems similar to fencing, where, you know, I'm attack. you know, the attacker doesn't feel obligated to attack. They can attack or not attack, whatever, right? Is this the situation we're dealing with with the dagger? Well, thus far, um, and certainly in my view, it isn't. That this doesn't, that kind of situation doesn't make any sense. We're not fencing with the dagger. One person is trying to murder the other one. If the if the if the attacker is not going to come on, the defender is going to leave or find a bigger weapon or get get their friends or whatever. You know what I mean? Only in the most like rarefied contexts are you going to have a situation where, you know, he has a dagger, you have a dagger, but he's not trying to murder you. He can wait until maybe he gets you to attack him instead and kind of fence you out a bit, right? So um, so this is all important for us understanding what's going on here, right? And it's important for us to reset our context or rather in the, to reinforce that the context of this engagement, we should understand it in my view to be identical to the context of the engagements we've seen so far. There's a murder going on. 
Um, someone has tried to murder you with a dagger, and you've responded. Okay? Now, in this case, the sixth remedy master, the seventh and the eighth, we're going to get responses with a dagger in hand. Okay? Um, and so, yeah, the last thing I want to talk about, so, so what did I say? First of all, the dagger kind of equalizes the fight in that you can do to them what they can do to you. Uh, to you. Number two, the dagger is a weapon and it's, and it's deadly and it's short. So them actually attacking you, um, accrues a tempo advantage to you if you do everything right. Um, but that's, uh, and that's great. That's great. That's, that's a main, that's a big reason to own a dagger or to, to, to always carry a dagger around if there ever was one. So that's number two. Number three is that, um, particularly with the sixth Remedy Master that we'll be dealing with today, and um, it's, it's, it's uh, brother or sister, the eighth Remedy Master, which is against the Sotani Blow. The sixth is going to be against uh, the Mendrito Fendente and uh, Re Reversi Blows. While it's true that the sixth and the eighth Remedy Master can resist blows resolutely and stoutly in the way that, you know, the fourth Remedy Master can resist a blow, in the way that the third will resist the blow, in the way that the first will resist the blow, right? Though the sixth Remedy Master and the eighth can do it, they're definitely not obligated to do it, okay? You can bleed off the force of a blow just like the crossed masters, right? The doubled and crossed seventh master and the second. You can bleed off that force to the left or the right as you see fit, right? The, the sixth and eighth can do it. So um, I actually made the mistake of kind of casually assuming that this was a resolute block um, defense in the scholar session, and I was um, corrected uh, by, by Jackie for it. I'm glad she did. Um, so, so that's something to consider, okay? So though we're looking at defenses with the dagger and the resolute blows, or the resolute covers do have advantages, and we'll talk about that. They're not necessary um, in the in the dagger or w w with these covers. Okay. So with all that said, let's actually get into it. The cover, sixth remedy master cover. Here we go. Let's pick our first victim. Alex, would you like to read the text for us, please? I am the Sixth Master, and I declare that this parry is a fine one, both in and out of armor. I can use it to parry on all sides and enter all the binds. I can also perform grapples and strikes, as you will see my students do when they complete my the actions. Every one of my students should execute this parry and follow with the plays that are possible. Okay, so <clears throat> pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, he says he can defend on all sides and enter all binds. And he can, and um, his students will perform grapples according to um, according to his cover, or uh, following his cover. Okay. Um, another thing to re remember for ourselves as well, and we're going to see this in the very next play, is that just because you're holding a dagger doesn't mean you have to use it. You can um, do tons of first master stuff, even though you're holding a dagger in your right hand. We'll recall that the first uh, that's grappling. We'll recall that the first Remedy Master, a lot of the plays are done with the left hand, right? And the right uh, the right hand is here. So when he says, I can do the plays of everybody that came before, we should take him seriously. Not least, if it was necessary, he could always drop the dagger, right? So let's keep all everything we've seen so far in our minds. It's all here as well as some interesting plays that are going to come with the with the dagger, okay? Um, yeah, that's fine. It's good both in and out of armor, right? And let's also remember in the uh, in the post section, he says that this doubled play is the best and strongest of all. He's very um, he's very uh, la laudatory about this doubled play here. Okay, moving on. All right, speak of the devil, 16RB. Can we get uh, Andrew? Would you like to read the text for us? I have just performed the parry of the sixth master who precedes me, and I immediately executed this grapple to strike you, as I now can do. 
I can also disarm you, which is why I hold my left hand in this position. I can place you in a middle bind, which is the third play of the first king or remedy of dagger. I can also perform other plays without letting go of my dagger. Okay. So, like I just said, um, I think this play can, I think it's reasonable to read this as a catch-all kind of play, kind of casually referring to the first remedy master. But strictly speaking, what this play is, um, I kind of call it the check and stab. Because there's, um, there's, there's also a play in the eighth remedy master that's very similar. Um, it's going to be this one. I think it's this one. Is it that one? Yeah. I think it's this one. So, um, ch check and stab. What do I mean by that? So, when you have the dagger... When he attacks, if you defend the blow, put registration on the dagger, and then take your dagger away, you have radically altered the circumstances, right? You now have flesh-on-flesh -flesh registration, or, you know, uh, if you were in armor, then it would be hand-on-hand, -hand, whatever, gauntlet. But you have good registration of the dagger hand itself. So great. You haven't been stabbed. Okay, that's also great. And you're in distance, and your dagger's free. They don't have registration on it. Okay? So this is fantastic. Not least because it's always, um, pot, it's always, uh, you know, it's not too difficult to stab things you're touching, right? So, um, you know, yes, you could take this dagger away and then go to stab them in the leg or the chest or something big, right? Or something towards their offhand. You could do that. But of course, they have an offhand. They can make a cover, whatever. Or you could stab them in the arm you're holding, right? Slip back and ram it up the arm, you know, halfway down the forearm that you're holding. You're holding the forearm, so you know where the hell it is in time and space. So it shouldn't be too hard to connect those two things, right? Or the elbow. You could look at this picture that he's stabbing the guy's elbow, right? Once you've stabbed his dagger hand and you've caused him injury, right? You made the dagger hand less useful, if not useless, then you can go and continue stabbing other parts of him or whatever. Maybe the situation has changed entirely and he doesn't want to kill you anymore, right? You don't know. But in this case, with what um, dagger defenses, uh, one major category of defenses that uh, dagger uh, defenses give you, right? Defending what the dagger gives you, it gives you check and stabs where you receive the blow immediately acquire a registration on the dagger, remove your dagger from the engagement and re-enter it in and have stabbing him with your dagger as sort of primary in your mind. And as long as you have good registration on this dagger, then you um, you can switch to the attack. Okay, And that can work out great. But additionally, um, though the eighth master, this one is a little more of a sort of canonical check and stab here. 17 rd um you also have opportunities to do a bunch of first master stuff in here right um from the first remedy master so he says you can do a middle key um let's pull up the middle key so he says you can do a middle key from here right he says you could disarm from here the disarm is in the text of the cover right what else could you do well he says you can do a, you could, you could do everything the other masters can do, right? So, um, you know, you could you could do a clothesline. You could do whatever, right? You could do lots of stuff, okay? Um, or the plays that he's going to show. Excuse me. So the check and stab, very simple, um, very elegant, but it starts to show you the different context, right? Here we have the we had the dagger person trying to murder someone, and if he was unarmed, he'd, he'd still be in a world of trouble. But now he's got registration, and he's stabbing right back. So oh, how things have changed, right? Although of course that's pretty uh, that's that's a pretty brutal piece of violence right there. But anyways, cool. Moving on. Second scholar, second scholar. Here we go. We get this play here. Sixteen R C. Who is next? Beatty, would you like to read the text for us, please? I performed the turn while holding the position of the sixth master, and I was quick to strike you. Even if you were in armor, I would not worry, since I could nicely hit you in the face with the dagger. 
Now I have struck you in the chest, since you are not wearing armor and you don't seem to know your close play. All right. So this is a great play. And it brings up another great topic, but it's specific to the, it's kind of specific to the Sixth Master. And that is the topic of um, where the trap go. Okay. So first of all, before we get into that, specifically what this play is, it's a suppression. Okay. So I should bring the master up so we can refer to him. So here's the master. Here's the cover. Okay. So from the cover, what's happened is the scholar has come on the outside of the opponent's arm and has transitioned from frontale to porta di ferro and is suppressing the dagger hand down of the enemy down towards their hip. But he's also shifted to, uh, you know, again, in, in keeping with all of our dagger uh, uh, def defenses, when we're, you know, going to the outside is fantastic. Going to the outside of the dagger arm, fantastic, eminently desirable. And we have that that little increase um, to the um, to our left. Uh Ahead, ahead and a bit to our left that we're doing with all of these all of these covers right um so he suppressed him but he's also shifted towards his um the, the enemy's right side away from his offhand and his suppression is with a pointy object that he's going to stab him with now so you can actually suppress the dagger and stab him with yours all while keeping yourself safe and you probably do this against a pullback Although you might do it against a push forward, maybe. It would depend on where the energy is going. If the energy was bleeding towards your, if, as the defender, if the energy was bleeding towards your right, you could get away with this as a pull, uh, from a push through as well. But this brings us to a sort of a, a, a en passant to another topic, which is what happened to the trap, okay? And it's something that I think is worth thinking about. Um, although it may seem rather academic uh, to, to some of you. Um, some of the scholars certainly thought so <laughs> when I brought it up on the scholar chat. But that is this. So with the defenses against the dagger, hitherto we have said that the trap, maybe not necessarily in this chat as a matter of fact, maybe in this course I haven't really made a big deal about it, but maybe I'll temporarily do that now. With these defenses against the dagger, unarmed, if the defense is not paired with a trap, then the defense is next to useless. And by trap, I mean that in some shape or form, the fingers of the defending hands have to close or wilt behind, be placed behind the wrist of the attacking dagger hand, such that if the dagger hand was pulled back you would achieve registration of that pullback on your fingers. And it would allow you to follow the hand and continue with pullback plays. If you don't have the trap, then you will not, you will not tell that he's pulling his arm back until you lose contact with the arm. Then you'll tell, but by then it's too late. So because the main risk of these um, basic defenses is him pulling his dagger away and reapplying it once you're in distance and don't have registration, the trap is absolutely fundamentally 1,000% critical. And it's probably the main reason why I would advocate once you have control, once you touch that dagger, don't let it go. So um, we've, been, we've been dealing with that principle. We've been dealing with that fact thus far right and we've done five masters now okay everything seems fine we get it where's the trap with this one there's no trap with this there's no fingers behind the, the hand what's to prevent him from just pulling the dagger away and reapplying it just like we feared right interesting little paradox okay interesting little um little element to this okay but as it turns out, there are several things which arguably make up for the fact that there is no trap. Okay. Number one, unlike defending with your hands, defending with the blade of the dagger can generate potentially significant pain compliance on the enemy. Especially if your dagger has blades, 
if they're trying to murder you, they're, you know, stabbing down as hard as they can, or presumably they're trying to kill you. You defend that blow stoutly, say, with the dagger. They're stabbing, uh, they're slamming their hand down onto metal, potentially, you know, bladed metal. That's going to suck. That pain compliance can potentially give you a tempo to act in a way that you wouldn't have got uh, before outside of maybe uh, the punch in the first remedy master, something akin to that, right? But first of all, it's um, we don't want to discount the pain compliance of this cover, okay? Second of all, because you have this tool, this dagger in your hand, you can attack this geometric structure in a way that you needed them to give you permission to do before. So a lot of the figure fours and the upper keys and things like that, you needed them to give you permission to do it. You needed them to be going that way anyway in order to get a tempo to do it. Here, it's much easier to get, all right? It's much easier to get. It's much easier to follow them. This suppression play, I think, is pretty key, right? It's not that you can't do some of the other things we're going to see, but if you were in doubt, you know, if as soon as you got this nice cover, if you were in any doubt, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even necessarily have to be like, it wouldn't really almost matter what he did. You could attempt this suppression, and it wouldn't be a bad thing, broadly speaking, right? Not least because the suppression is coming with a bit of isolation, right? So um, being able to suppress this dagger with, you know, with, with this structure here, having that as an option is super great, okay? It's a, a super great, especially combined with this little pain compliance bit. Um, we're going to see a couple other plays that are going to resemble high keys that are going to um, also factor into this notion. But all I wanted to say there is, is that... Um, well, first to bring up the fact that we're not looking at the trap here. For the dagger on dagger plays, we're not looking at the trap here. But in many ways, it doesn't matter. Not least because if he attacks us and we defend it and he draws his dagger back, what, what happens? Well, the situation is now I have a dagger and he has a dagger. And if he's an idiot, he'll kill attack me again. Now it's not even a surprise, right? Now not only I know where he is, but I have my dagger out. Maybe I had to draw it out for the defense, right? Who knows, right? So this, you know, attacking again into the situation without the element of surprise, much more difficult to get stuff done as the dagger person against somebody with a dagger who knows that you're going to do it, right? So this trap, yes, it's not there, but... There's things we can do to compensate. Not only that, and the situation is much more even. So it, it very may very uh, it may very well be that if we added up all the sort of the universals of the situation, that the not having the trap there isn't that big of a deal. Um, so isn't that interesting, right? And you know, again, doesn't the suppression kind of count as a trap in a way itself too? So very cool, very neat. Having that dagger, you know, like a breath of fresh air. I think, man, you were, were much less screwed than we were before. All right, um, the next play. Oh, is this the next play? Yeah, it is. Oh, okay. The next play, the disarm. I love this play so much. Uh, this is play 16RD. Let's go with uh, Bruce. Would you like to give us a read? Uh, we're using the first edition. Whatever you wish. <clears throat> without abandoning, without abandoning the parry of the sixth master, I turned my left arm above your right. Also, I have coordinated the action of my arm with that of my right foot, thereby turning my body to the reverso side. You are half tied up, and can very well wave your dagger goodbye. If I perform the play quickly, I don't have to fear a count. All right. So thank you very much, Bruce. All right. So this is the disarm. Um, this is the play to impress uh, people. If you're ever doing a dagger demonstration anywhere, you need to do some plays that impress people. This is definitely one of them. It's super flashy. Um, also, um, to be noted, uh, I asked the scholars if this beard was actually gold, uh, gold glazed, and apparently it's not. It's just shading. So isn't that kind of shit? You think the, the, this forked beard deserves some gold uh, 
um, some, some, some gold, I think. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. So what, what, what the hell is going on here? So this disarm is in concept a very, very similar disarm to the disarms we see at the end of the strato section of the sword in two hands. Okay, so let's look at that. So, um, do, do, do. <laughs> sword in two hands, sword in two hands, here we go. Strato section. Okay, so first disarm, 30 RC in the finish. Uh, first disarm, sorry, did I say third? First disarm, 30 RC. Second disarm, 30 VA. Third disarm, 30 VB. Fourth disarm, 30 VC. Okay? All of these disarms are similar mechanically in that they involve turning the sword around its X axis, around, turning the sword um, against, uh, 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 how to describe it, <laughs> turning the sword um, perpendicular to the blade, to the edges of the blade. So if the, if the, the hilt and the, the cross guard aligns to the edges of the blade, this disarm occurs by putting force perpendicular to those lines, to the line of the blade, the blade edges and the cross guard, which crosses the arms of the person holding it and levers the sword out of the opponent's arms. The sword levers itself really out of the opponent's arms. Okay. And all of these plays get that done in various distances, but more or less through the same mechanic. Okay. This is very similar. Okay. This play doesn't actually disarm the dagger by popping it out through the opening in the, in the hand. This dot, a disarm turns the hand around such that the fingers have to let go or the wrist breaks. The fingers let go and the dagger um, pops out. Okay. And um, uh, I'm not even sure I could explain how to do this in, 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 in text or uh, in, in words. Um, the, basically, the way, the, the way that you do this disarm is you do a little tuta volta from the moment of the cover. So here you are, you, you're at the moment of the cover. If you do a little tuta volta, so you take this, this, this foot and you bring it behind yourself, and you attack the arm like the third remedy master. You're going to end up with this disarm as well as with something of a third remedy master situation. Okay. Um, the, the, the trick to doing this in class, and this is what people often have the most trouble with, as well as with these other four disarms. The trick to doing this is to coordinate your whole body. Your whole body has to move in proportion at the right time and in the right way. And then it works great. Um, and that's only something that we can train. There's no point describing it. Um, what else is there to say? Yeah, with respect to the timing, yep, a stay energy, like most of our disarms, the stay energy is great. Um, probably not a pullback, maybe a push through. You could maybe get it with a push through. Okay. Once you get this disarm, you should still have hold of their arm or at least registration. The natural blow, given that your 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 dagger grip is um, the sotani grip, right? It's point um, sopra mano, point above the hand. You're probably going to stab them underneath the arm, right? They're going to try and stand back up, right? They're going to try and, and and stand back up, become erect. If you have control of this arm feeding that dagger underneath their arm is is great it's a deadly blow into the armpit and not only that but you can you're feeling their arm so you know exactly where it is and of course it's given that um even if it was in armor it would be great in armor right um because that part is um typically uh, poorly armored okay so yeah great play fantastic play um and yeah really fun to do the, the <laughs> The, the most fun I've ever had doing this play in class is doing it in a class of like 
<laughs> like 25 students <laughs> where you had you had you had twirling twirling daggers flying through the air right past past people's heads for like 20 minutes <laughs> it's pretty stupid now that i think about it but hey everybody's fine nobody died right it's all good moving on moving on all right the next one folio 16 va another stab can we get uh, connor all the way from the far east please read us the text after executing my master's parry i perform this grapple which enables me to strike you regardless of whether you are wearing armor I can also place you into the high bind of the first student of the fourth Remedy Master of the Dagger. All right. Thank you, Connor. <clears throat> so this is kind of similar to the um, check stab, um, well, the kind of check stab concept that I was thinking of, not least because, you know, he's got he's got one hand on the arm and he's stabbing with the other dagger. But he actually refers to some high keys. Um I can also place you into the high bind of the first student of the fourth Remedy Master of Dagger. So let's look that up. The fourth Remedy Master of Dagger, first student. Here we go. Boom. First scholar, this guy. Folio 14VB. So um, he says you can do this play as a follow-on as well. Um, if pictures matter... It's notable that the difference between the um, the the check stab, which was play what six, it was the next play after this one, right? The first call, yeah. So sixteen uh, RB. It's notable that the handedness of the defender is palm to the left, typical of the first remedy master, uh, whereas the handedness of this one is typical of the fourth. Remedy Master. And sure enough, doesn't he reference the fourth Remedy Master in the text? So, okay, it may seem in this play that he's kind of repeating himself a bit. In a sense, he is, because we've already seen this check stab. But if pictures matter, and if this handedness is significant, then um, maybe he's explicitly referencing the fourth Remedy Master here right? That's not super controversial, I'm sure. Um, we see that, you know, this hand here, it's not in the best structural place. The first Remedy Master covers a better structure for more prolonged, you know, attachment to this arm. But, because uh, really the only thing preventing this arm from leaving is the thumb here, right? That's the problem. Um, but again, with the check stab, it's not necessarily relevant. And he says you could al you could also do this um, high key as well how would you do the high key if you're holding your dagger i've done that in class a couple times or rather i've experimented i'm not exactly sure i think there's ways to do it without giving up your dagger it's possible that you might give it up i'm not sure but the, you know if you've engaged this way you've gripped this way are the fourth remedy master high keys available to you yeah sure why not and of course, you know, if you happen to give up your dagger, the fourth remedy master disarms and all the other plays are available to you too. So cool. Nothing we didn't know before, but if you're showing this to us again, cool. Great. Um, also, let's note the constant repetition of whether or not someone's in armor, right? If we were ever in any doubt that he's got armor in mind with these plays, we should be in no doubt, I think, right? We are, there are two sides of our brains, armored and unarmored. We're moving on. The next play, oh, this is another one of my favorites. This is great. 16 VB. Can we have Dimitri read the text for us? I performed this turn without abandoning, abandoning the parry of the Sixth Master. As you see, I'm turning my dagger around, so your right hand is about to let go of it. And, this, and as you let go of it, I will strike you quickly with mine dagger, I assume. This is a turn that I could perform with my left arm. I will then let you suffer in the low bind. 
Okay. So this is another impressive one, I think. Um, it's a party. It's a party pleaser. It also demonstrates um, how awesome it is to have a dagger here. So what's going on in this play? So right from the cover, ah, I shifted this one last time. Right from the cover, you are spearing. You're you're rocketing the point of this dagger into their armpit their elbow pit behind their arm right you're just you're just you're just slamming it in there okay the act of rotating the dagger here is going to lock up once you've is, once you've hit their their armpit it's going to lock up the dagger controlling it adequately right so it's going to it's going to suffice as a trap and this one you can do th um not this this one you can do from uh, from a pause or even from the beginning of a pushback. In fact, I think this works fantastic against a pullback, not least because the pullbacks generally tend to bend the arm. With the pullbacks, the arm, the hand tends to start first. You know, people tend not to pull back with their shoulder first, right? Um, leaving, this, leaving the elbow to bend last. Usually it's the elbow first and then the shoulder. So if, the, if they bend their elbow a bit, you have contact and they're pulling back, boom, you can rocket this thing in. And it sucks. You can do it pretty damn hard. It locks it up perfectly. It gives you great control over this whole geometric structure. It can stab them. Like if they're not wearing a great armor in the elbows, it's, you know, God forbid they're unarmored. It could give them a grievous, potentially inju uh, injurious wound to their elbow. And it can facilitate a pretty badass lower key right the entry and it's kind of neat structurally too though the entry into the elbow is technically from the outside and you know if you were going to do a lower key your entry to the lower key would also be from the outside right you would you know you'd stab the stab the elbow pull it out let go of the dagger with your with your left hand come into the bend of the arm with your wrist and then um, increase and slip into the lower key. Okay, it's a very very slick play. It seems complicated, but it's not really that complicated. It makes it the lower key follows from the success of this stab, and even if it, this stab didn't give any pain compliance whatsoever, it's a fantastic defensive action because it locks the whole thing up. Right now, obviously you have to watch out for the offhand coming in that elbow push. That's true, but um, you can you can do this right from the uh, from the cover. You can do this very confidently. So um, as long as the arm isn't super straight. I, I suppose. So to, to so confirm, you're you're just overpowering them basically. Well, you know, uh, mm, mm, mm. overpower, overpower. If I said that, will Brian well, like, show up? You're not like door? you're not like slipping around. <laughs> Like the, the dagger or anything. Yeah, well, uh, you. Mm, how shall I say it? You have a superior, ge um, you have a superior uh, ge geometric position. Uh, you you have superior leverage. In this case, you have superior leverage with this with this play. So the act of stabbing that dagger into the elbow turns the blade away from you. It also traps and secures the dagger. It can also give them, uh, can also give them potential uh, uh, injury and pain compliance, and even if he didn't get injured, it could still lead to a nice strong lower key, which would be even better. Not least because the lower key would be with your left hand, and the dagger would be in your right, so you could still stab uh, stab the shit out of him with your dagger. So, so his his the attacker's blade mm -hmm. is trapped between the blade and the hilt of my dagger. Uh, if I'm looking at this at this picture, I'm trying to yeah. work out how to get from the cover to this. Yeah, yeah. His, so his blade mm -hmm. is now trapped. Yeah, uh, I'm yeah, trying exactly. to work out exactly how his hand ends up flipped uh, upside down. So the, the point of your dagger goes over the outside of his arm and into his elbow from there. 
So. It's really quick to show. It's, it, it'd, be, it'd be easy to show you in person. Yeah, but... I know. This is this is one of this is one of these things. So the the edge of the dagger is coming straight in here, and the um the the hilt of the dagger is snapping up in this in the crux of the hand here. So at the, yeah, at, okay. the, um, at the end of the play, the daggers will be um, almost parallel, right? They'll, well, they they they'll, they'll they may be even they may be almost parallel, right? Yours will be, uh, you know, here with the hilt up here, and and his will be um, uh, often point down, right? Uh, I don't. Although that actually brings up a good point. I, I, I think I see how the mechanics. Anyways, yeah, it's it's it's. I, I see the mechanics of it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a very. Yeah, I can see how the mechanics yeah. go from there to there. Mm -hmm. It's a very sturdy uh, geometric position, and you know, it's possible to even get a disarm out of it with the pain compliance. They might even let go with the dagger. So, it's uh, it's great. It's a good one. It's a good one. All right, moving on. The counter. Oh shit! Are we there already? Is that the end of the master? I was having so much fun. It's not over already, is it? Uh oh! It is almost over. Wow! Oh shit! This is going too fast. <laughs> All right. So we're on the counter. Folio uh, 16 VC. Uh, can we have uh, Graham read the text for us, please? Sure. I perform the counter of the sixth king by pushing your elbow. This will make your body turn, at which point I will be able to strike you. Having quickly bent your elbow, I can execute several defenses of close play, especially the counter to the grapples of the close play. All right, cool. So the counter to the grapples of close play, I believe that involve um, that references the um, face and uh, in an eye uh, pushes and strikes that we saw in Abrazari. It's not obvious what this means, but the counter is pretty clear. So um, the counter is an elbow push. Shocker. Right? If one was a dagger man, and if one was trying to murder someone who actually drew their dagger and attempted to make the cover in time, one would be, you know, ill-advised to thunder in all the force of the blow into the strike. As a matter of fact, giving a basic attack against an opponent lying in guard is one of the fundamental you deserve to die uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, principles that we get from the sword section. And it's also why provocations are so critical to understand. Hint for later. But if you are attacking and you're in this situation, you see them coming up to defend, completing the attack, you know, well, it's probably too late to, 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 to change up, but you can take some force out of it so you don't crush your hand against the blade of the dagger and concentrate on getting the counter off, right? And that's kind of similar to the countering situation that you have against the other um, the other uh, defensive masters. You know, you're attacking them. They come up to defend you. You, you know, you can see you're looking at them. You can see they're, they're coming up to defend you. Okay, fine. Maybe you pull a little muscle out of it and bring in that offhand. Right. And you're pulling that mustard out of it um, just so that you don't, you know, over attack, you know, you know, bleed that force off into a place where you don't want to be. So you maintain control of it. Um, yeah. OK, but the counter elbow push pretty, pretty standard. Um, yeah, not much to say. I don't think this should be surprising to anybody. Whenever the hands are doubled, whenever both hands are available. Uh, or are engaged in a play, the elbow push is the standard response from Fury. Okay, uh, let's move to the next one. The last one. Oh, man, this is the last one. Um, and, oh, wait, there's one more in the PD, isn't there? Uh, shit. Didn't we have fun with that last one in the PD? Um... Oh, yeah, this one. Okay, whatever. It doesn't matter. I don't want to waste time on it. All right. 
So cool. So um, so we just did the counter, but then we get one final scholar to cap off this awesome six remedy master coming after the counter, which is interesting. Um, and it's 16 V D. So can we have uh, Renat read the text for us, please? Although I have been placed after the counter of the sixth play, I logically belong before it because I am a student and my play belongs to the sixth master. This is a better play in armor than out of armor, which is why I'm striking my opponent in the hand as that part of the body is not easy covered with armor effectively. Against an unarmored opponent, I would try to strike the face, the chest, or even a place much worse than those. <laughs> Anyone think what uh, that they know what he's referring to? <laughs> and even a place much worse than those. Oh, man. All right. Okay, cool. So this is such a hard spot to reach. Uh, <laughs> you mean that? You mean the left pinky toe? Yeah, I know, man. Oh, what a terrible <laughs> spot. Um, okay, so this is a really neat play. This is a really neat play. Not least because um, I think the text kind of suggests that he added it in at the last minute. I don't know. That's that's my guess. I am I've been placed after the counter of the sixth play, but I belong before it. Oh. Okay. Why didn't you put it before it? I don't know. Was it a latecomer to the play? All right, cool. Interesting. Um, I'm the student of the sixth play. Yeah, yeah. This is a better play in armor than out of armor. Have we seen that said yet? About any play? That it's better in armor than out of armor? I don't think so. In the dagger section. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but... I don't think we've seen this this little this this kind of comment before. So interesting, right? Interesting little little piece of data there. This is a better play in armor than out of armor, which is why I am striking my opponent in the hand, as that part of the body is not as easy to cover with armor effectively. Against an armored opponent, sorry, against an unarmored opponent, I might try to strike the face or chest. Or even some other place if you had really bad luck. Let's put a pin in this thought and save it for a second. Let's deal with this first. Better in armor. That's why I'm striking the hand. It's not easy to cover effectively. Okay. So uh, what is this play? Well, he's stabbing the hand. As it's coming down, he's stabbing the hand. Okay. Um. So why would you do this? What's the deal? Well, um, as he said, very simply, in armor, this is a difficult place to cover the, the, the hand. Some people have mailed hands in armor, but it's not common. And the mailed hands, uh, I, I have it on report, although I've never tried it myself. I have it on report that the mailed hands are really hard to grip shit with. They're a little slippery. Um, so, so there's that. Um, but, uh, so, you know, the dagger's coming down, it's got the force of gravity, and you're stabbing the hand. If pictures matter, if pictures mean anything, in the Getty, he seems like he's got some kind of a more strength structure, in my view. I don't believe in this play, at least as it's shown in the Getty, which is what we're dealing with principally right now, that he's making the cover with the point of the dagger. I think he's making the cover with the left arm. Or rather, he's got the point of the dagger above his hand, and he's going to slam that shit into this, this, this attack that's coming down, but he's also covering with the left arm at the same time, just in case he misses. That's my read. Seems fairly prudent. Um, and I think that's what the picture is showing. Uh, there are a few scholars that disagree with me on that, um, principally uh, because they they think the spirit of the play is better shown or is better expressed in the PD version. And in the PD version, he's gripping it uh, with a spent arm, and he's stabbing directly into the dagger. Right, so he's not actually giving that first master cover, or at least not 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 the way it seems. 
Um, I'm not going to say any more on that. I don't want to get into the controversy, but um, this is an interesting little little play here. Um, and it's also, interestingly, it's also in a way kind of payback for um, uh, for it's kind of payback for the defender for this play, right? This is the dirtiest, grossest counter that there is. It's super rough on the defender. And, you know, we've talked about it before. It's pretty, it's pretty cheap. If anything was unfair in Fury, which there isn't, but if anything was unfair, this is unfair. It's too easy. It's too good. This one is kind of the payback. In, in my mind, I think, spiritually, it's the payback. Because, of course, if he's coming to murder you, he's got to give you a good attack. And if you've got that dagger out, well, we'll just stab him in the hand while you make the cover. Why not? Right? And unless, you know, un anyways, it's just, it's, it's pretty great. It's pretty great. Um, so, but it's not complicated. You know, I'm not sure there's much more to say about it. You're stabbing them in the hand as they make the cover. Would you do this against a reverso? Probably not. Um, doing a reverso attack against somebody with a dagger would be pretty dumb. Right? The reverso cover is solid enough as it is. Uh, with the dagger, the reversal cover is, or the reversal attack is, oof, especially as a leading blow, you might as well just give uh, give your dagger away. So, but against Vendente I wonder, and, and Madridos, it's it's great. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if the way he's put it in here, mm -hmm. if this is a, a a standalone defense, if the guy's coming down and you jab, my jab, my the point of my dagger into his hand mm -hmm. as it's coming down mm -hmm. if i miss in either case the way this is drawn if i miss then what i have is almost a doubled up defense uh where it's coming down pat over my forearm and if i miss the other way it it slides automatically into the sixth remedy master uh. who's blocking with the double dagger uh, yeah, well, that's, so how, this uh, one, that's how I read this it. This one depends on ac yeah. This one ac depends on accuracy. Yeah. If it's not accurate, then what I'm doing is I'm I've I've got my my left, yeah. uh, his drawn, the left forearm, mm. then catches the dagger coming down, mm. and if I miss the other way, mm. then I'm automatically into exactly the the cross hand. So, exactly. so uh, it's, it's, it's six or the first. That's possibly. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's my reading. That's my reading. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, isn't that interesting? Again, stabbing the da the the dagger hand is going to be pain compliance. It might be injury. Not sure. That would depend. Um, but also, the sixth remedy master, just as a final sort of a summary, the sixth remedy master has pain compliance and hey, potential injury incumbent in the very cover depending on the nature of the dagger you're holding. If you give a really strong attack and you have a bladed dagger, um, you know, something nice and, and stout, even a, even a not bladed dagger, you know, slammed stoutly into the arm, or rather into the wrist on the, on the cover, could do significant damage. So isn't that cool? Um, does anyone have any questions about the Sixth Harmony Master? Yeah, sorry, can you go back to the Fifth Scholar? Absolutely. Three. Four, five, fifth scholar, sixteen VB. Mm -hmm. Can you like walk through again, like what exactly happens after the cover is made? Because uh, sure. the, the clarification that we're given, like, made you more confused. Okay. <laughs> All right then. Let me um, let me try harder. Um, so, okay. Um, let me bring the master up. So let's let's stare at the master. So directly from the cover here, this point is going to come into this this armpit from outside. So if we can if we can see this play in our mind, the point of the dagger is to the outside of their arm, right? The 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 hilt of the dagger is to the inside of their arm, where the knife edge of their of their hand will um differentiate the two right so from this point is already outside this this enemy's arm the point is going to come straight into the armpit and the point coming straight into the armpit is going to raise the hilt up 
which is going to um, which is going to lock the dagger out. It's going to push the blade to the outside. Okay. Now the so uh, are, you, are you moving your right hand? Are you moving your right hand to like assist that, or are you just like forcing it with your left hand? So you're moving both hands. So okay. the right hand is going to go up. The left mm -hmm. hand is going to go down. Okay. And when you say armpit, do you mean armpit I'm or the sorry. elbow? I'm sorry. I mean, I mean elbow pit. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. The elbow. Pit. I think of it as turning your dagger to the right while you're doing this. Turning it to the. Turning, turning your dagger. You're turning your dagger to the right to get the point yeah. into. The yeah. Middle. Yeah. 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 Whereas, and so, so um, another interesting point is that this technically the same turn but to the opposite side is what you're doing with the disarm uh jib 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 with, with this the third scholar okay in this case you're actually turning the dagger in the other way all right but because when, when you do it this way you're not securing the point of the dagger into flesh so you're you, you're getting a full rotation turn out of it and it's gonna and it's 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 turning the wrist around. In, this case, hmm? in that play, you also go on the right side. That that is also true. That is also true. But it's not the so, same turn. Yeah, yeah. It's the opposite. It's to the opposite side as this one. I think. Well, I, I mean, like the uh, the tip goes forward in both cases, right? Actually, hold on a second. Did I just lie to you? Uh, fuck. It might be the same turn. Anyways, whatever. In mechanically, it's the same turn. <laughs> mechanically, it's the same turn. Whether it's to the right or the left or whatever, um, you know, uh, you're you're leveraging the the iron bar you have in your hand here um, to to affect this thing. You could do the same thing with the bastonocello. cello. Even though the bastonocello cello presumably isn't sharp on the ends, you could. You could, you know, jam it into the elbow to, um, you know, uh, make the bend in their arm more pronounced, which would allow you to enter into the lower key. Okay, so the um, the bastard cello could. Oh shit, where's the play? The bastard cello could work uh, just the same, although it wouldn't have the pain compliance part of it. But um, yeah, so the fifth play, you're jamming that point into their arm. It's locking the dagger. This hands come up. Right hands come up. And it's got a lower key incumbent in it. Does that, does and that make sense? And you've also like turned away such that their initial attack. Because like my, the thing I, I was confused by is that I don't understand what you're actually doing to alleviate the threat of the dagger. It seems like you're like turning the dagger away, but you're allowing them to then stab you. Oh, okay. So what does the threat of the dagger come from? The force behind it. Exactly. So this is already the it's already the case you've made the cover, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and if the dagger is still here, then it hasn't bled off to the left or bled off to the right, right? Yep. If it did bleed off to the right or did bleed off to the left, you'd have all the plays of the third remedy master or the first remedy master, right? Yep. Or you'd have the check stab or you'd have other things. In this case, the dagger has remained in the, here, right? Whether, you know, how much force was behind it in the end, who knows? But at the moment of the cover, the dagger's here. So if it's the case, if this is the case, you have the, um, this play as an option. Even further, even if the arm was straight on the attack, which is typical, if they pull back, if you feel a, re a release of pressure, right? If you feel them shifting away, you know, obviously you have to be paying attention. You can rock at this point into their elbow and stop that, right? And stop them pulling, pulling back, even if they've, moved you know shifted back a teeny tiny bit right um so it's, it's a great it's a great one this is akin to the in in my in my opinion this is akin to the trap uh there's not really any way they can stop you from doing this and in fact he says uh if you can do this quickly there's no counter doesn't he say that or is that not this one Okay, he doesn't say it with this one, so fine. So, so you basically <laughs> just you're you're rotating your dagger around their forearm to, to get yes. to their elbow. Uh, okay. essentially, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You are welcome. We'll um we'll do this a lot. I think one of the now now that we're going through the section, I think one of the things that we're gonna do at least in the Toronto cell, um, I we're gonna try and um we're gonna do more dagger on dagger stuff with recruits when we get back. 
as I, you know, it's uh, the scholar test, strictly speaking, doesn't have dagger on dagger stuff, but I think it's good context. I think it's good context. But anyway, that's a that's a teaching note to me. Uh, okay, cool. So any other questions about the sixth remedy master? I know we're, we're nearing time today. Um, we're going to do the seventh. The seventh is quite quick. Uh, maybe the eighth. Um, who here has to go at at nine thirty? Anybody? Awesome. All right, cool. Then maybe we'll get the seventh and the eighth. So we'll just we'll we'll soldier on. All right. Enough Gavin here, and let's move on. Okay, cool. Seventh remedy master. Let's do it. So the sixth was a our defense doubled with the dagger. The seventh is our defense doubled and crossed with the dagger. And it's only got two plays, the master and the counter. <laughs> so Fury is not wasting space on the page with this one. So 17 RA, let's take the text. Let's go with um, Amber. Would you like to read the text with this one? I am the seventh master and I play with my arms crossed. This parry is better in armor. What I can do from this parry are the previous plays, i.e. the middle bind, which is the third play of the first remedy master of dagger. I can also turn you by pushing your right elbow with my left hand and immediately strike you in the head or shoulders. This parry is done mostly to get into binds and is very good against a dagger. Oh, all right. So lots of shit here and we might as well spend some time on it a little bit because there's no plays or at least there's no plays that are shown in the master. So first of all, let's take note. It's doubled and crossed. Okay. So um, we know from the doubled and crossed plays we've seen before and from the posters that in principle, these plays are better in armor because they're short. Okay. Having said that, Fiori thinks the doubled uh, plays um, or these, the, the crossed plays where they work, um, he thinks they're great. Um, so this parry is even better, or is better in armor. Okay, great, fine. What I can do from this parry are the previous plays, i.e. the middle bind. How many times has he repeated this bloody thing now? I mean, of all the plays, he says like middle bind, middle bind, middle bind. He says freaking tons of times, right? If the text means anything, then his consistent mention of the middle bind definitely seems curious, right? He seems to like it. Seems to like it. So, okay, cool. He likes the middle bind, um, which is the first, play, uh, the third play of the first remedy of dagger. It's also everywhere else. I can also turn you by pushing your right elbow with my left hand. Whoa, what? I can turn you by pushing your right elbow with my left hand. Well, how can you do that if your left hand is on the dagger? Oh, you mean take it off the dagger? What? So, um, not only do we know that the na it's the, it's in the nature of the double uh, of the crossed plays not to stoutly resist the force of the blow but to bleed it off once the engagement is made we know that's in their nature we should expect this from this as well however we also see that fiore suggests that even in this case along with all the other plays that we have we also have an elbow push and specifically an elbow push against this elbow now, what the, what's the context of this sort of thing? Well, logically, the force would need to not bleed to your left and enter first master territory in order for you to get outside this elbow, right? If it was a fendente, maybe you could, you know, nudge it to your right a bit as a defender. If it was a reverso, well, hell yeah, right? Anything along there, right? Anything from um, from 90 degrees up, I mean, up until whatever, to your to your right side, you're you have the potential to get outside this arm, and letting go of the point of this dagger once the engagement's made, and pushing that elbow, is going to leave you in a fantastic position. In fact, it's going to leave you in a position that we're going to see 
much sooner than we think because the dagger against sword section is coming up like a freight train we're almost finished the dagger and the one of the key plays in the dagger on sword section is an elbow push um with the dagger against the sword so what the what the just as a brief sort of uh, taster the dagger is going to actually pass back on the defense which is super crazy super unique in in fury but whatever moving on he's going to pass back on the defense get the blow trade contact basically from the dagger on the blade of the sword to the offhand of the dagger man on the main arm of the swordsman and then he's going to leave the sword with his dagger and apply a strike so he's going to receive with the dagger trade to the offhand and then reapply the dagger with the dagger hand okay this is what fiore is advocating here so along with all the other plays we know he's saying keep in mind what you can do is you make the defense as soon as you're not dead let, let your offhand go elbow push his dagger hand and then stab with the dagger reapply with the dagger and you're going to have your um your um soto mano grip you have your ice pick grip here you can get some great attacks here so isn't that neat isn't that cool that's another kind of version of the check stab though in this case the check stab is to the outside as it were right you're checking on the outside of their arm so neat very powerful another example of how the dagger is how dagger and dagger is there's it's significantly different than dagger against unarmed right there's a there's a difference in power uh in power dynamic here okay um last but not least this parry is mostly done to get into binds and is extremely effective he says this in a couple times with the with the crossed plays is done mostly to get into binds by this i think um we understand him to mean keys breaks you know figure fours lower keys all those you know sorts of things if you want to get in there you know uh then the cross the you want to get in tight there and you're not worried about incidentals right especially if you're in armor uh then these crossed plays are great and the doubled and crossed play is even better okay um last but not least i'd be remiss to note uh, that though you're doubled and crossed it can easily become doubled right you can uncross and be in six remedy master and then you have all of the six remedy master plays available to you <laughs> so when we said at the beginning of the section that this section was going to feed back in on a, uh back in on itself whole oh boy has it started in a big way right the seventh remedy master has everything from masters one two three four five and six and it all depends on what the hell goes on after the cover all right the only other thing to talk about is the counter but i'm pretty sure we know what the counter is going to be <gasps> an elbow push god damn it uh let's go right back to the top uh bd or no alex would you like to read this one uh 17 rb this is the counter of the seventh master we have just seen done by pushing the opponent's right elbow this counter is actually good in every close play of dagger axe sword and <laughs> armor and sword unarmored the strike to the opponent's shoulder needs to happen immediately after he pushes elbow holy shit! talk about beating us over the goddamn head with this elbow push right okay we get it fury all right we get it oh god it's good okay counter's good elbow push Whew. sheesh all right what else is there to say Furious, Furious pegged us over the head with it uh, so many times already. Obviously, both hands are in. The elbow push is, you know, is there. It's going to be devastating. He's going to get to reapply the dagger after the elbow push, just like what we just talked about is available with the uh, with the cover. So great. There we go. There we go. Okay. Let's go to the eighth. Eighth Remedy Master. Boom. All right. So um, let's maybe pause very briefly. So the eighth and ninth are interesting in that 
we're finally dealing with Sotanis. We dealt with a few Sotanis in the fifth Remedy Master. Let's refresh our memory. We dealt with Sotanis in do, 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 do. the tenth Scholar, the eleventh Scholar, where we're going to see the we're going to see the same disarm in the ninth Remedy Master as a teaser. So the tenth uh, Scholar, the eleventh Scholar. 15 VB and 15 VC. So we saw Sotanis, which is the blow um, from underneath. We saw them here. That was the first time, I think. But every other um, play has been against blows that come from above. Mendritos, Fendentes, and Reversos. So in the last two Remedy Masters of Dagger, the 8th and the ninth, we're going to see his responses to um, Sotanos. In the 8th, we're going to see his responses to Sotanos when he has a dagger. And in the 9th, we're going to see his responses to Sotanos without the dagger. And now we'll complete the section. Okay? We will do the ninth Remedy Master next time. We'll finish with the 8th, and then we'll open for questions and stuff. So then next session will be the ninth, uh, a quick recap of the dagger, and then uh, on to the sword and dagger section, which will be sweet. But moving on, we have four plays to look at. So... The cover, uh, 17RC, cover against the Sotano. Uh, Andrew, would you like to read the text for us? I am the eighth master, and I cross with my dagger, a play good both in and out of armor. Some of my plays come afterwards, and some we already saw. The fourth play before me, in which the opponent gets hit in the hand as he delivers an overhand dagger thrust, can also be done against an underhand thrust. Ooh, first time I noticed that. I could also grasp the opponent's hand at the wrist with my right hand, while striking him with my right, as you will see in the play of the ninth student of the ninth master, who sticks his dagger into the opponent's chest. I could do I could also do the last play, see next letting go of my dagger. Okay, cool. So he references a bunch of stuff. He references the ninth master. So this is actually for the book nerds um among you, this is actually really interesting because there is no ninth master in the PD. And is there any Paris plays of the ninth master? I'm not sure if there's the Paris dagger section is a vomit, vomitous mess. Um, let's see, let's go here. Do, do, do. Forgive me, hope I'm not making anybody dizzy. There isn't, I didn't think there was. I didn't think there was. Oh, uh, there's one. Oh, shit. All right, there is. <laughs> All right, so there, there are Paris plays of the ninth. But um, the the eighth remedy master is unique in um, to the Getty. The uh, the Pisani Dossi only has, which is the only other complete manuscript. The Pisani Dossi only has eight of uh, remedy masters, and the eighth remedy master in the PD is the ninth uh, in the Getty. Okay, if that's confusing, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, that's just to say that in the Getty, it's clearly planned. So there, them being nine, or there being nine masters here in the Getty, it's clearly planned. Um, the text confirms it, so it's not a mistake or an after addition or something like that. It's pretty good, pretty good that it's planned to be nine. So um, interesting that there's a whole difference of master between the PD and the uh, and the Getty. But anyway, so the eighth remedy master is this doubled play against the Sotano. So um, all the principles and concepts that we were looking at with this double play and the six remedy master, they're going to apply here if you cover this way. All right. Um, he said some interesting things. He said that some of the um, some plays come afterwards. He's going to reference the ninth master and some we already saw. The fourth play before me in which the opponent gets hit in the hand as he delivers. An, so the, the last play of the of the sixth master. Oh, it says the fourth play before me. Oh, shit. That play isn't the fourth. 
Oh, maybe it's referring to the folio. Oh, shit. I have to look into that. Note to self, maybe the, maybe that play in the Sixth Masters is misordered. Maybe this is textual evidence this is misordered. Anyways, that's interesting. Um, so the anyways, he's saying the play that where the opponent gets hit in the hand as he delivers an overhand dagger thrust can also be done underhanded. Isn't that cool? I've definitely done this in class a bunch of times. It works in theory the same as the one overhand. You can do it as you know the same more strength sort of way um, with the same with the same principles and potential follow-ons. Though obviously the overhand one is going to be less forceful because you're going against gravity, but uh, it's really cool that you can do it the same. Um, and, it, and it works great actually. I, I I'm more confident doing the fourth uh, doing this one against the Sotano than I am doing the overhand one. The overhand one makes me a little nervous. Um, but this one, it's I think it's pretty pretty good. Um, Sorry, dumb question, but what do you mean by overhand, overhand in this context? So um, I mean, so the play where um, in the sixth master, where we... Let me refer to it directly. In the play of the sixth remedy master at the end, where we... Um, stab the hand of this of the attacker as the scholar we stab the hand of the attacker doing an overhand attack so giving us a mandrito a fendente or a reverso so the hand is coming down towards us from above and here we're coming up underneath it kind of letting gravity slam onto the point of our dagger and isn't that cool in this one Where am I? Um, in this one, he says, you can do this same play here, but you can do it against the Sotano attack. Okay, I see. Thank okay. you. So that's, that, that's, that's what he means. Um, I could also grasp his hand at the wrist with my right hand. I think he means his left. I'm pretty sure... Um, Bruce can check, you know, you can um, uh, check this out later, but I'm pretty sure if it says right hand, I'm pretty sure that's an error because the right hand is holding the dagger. So I think what he means here is to do a check stab play, which we're actually going to see uh, in a second. Uh, I think actually it's next as it happens. Um, but um, what he means is that you can make the cover and then grasp the, the enemy's dagger hand with your left, with your off hand, and do the check step. Um, and so isn't that cool? And you see... Um, you, just you, for, an mm -hmm. interesting, for an interesting note, uh, my translation says his left hand. Which one are you using, by the way? I am not sure. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a, it, it's a bunch of different ones. Uh, the Tracy Mello design and layout and... Okay. What Five about, different translations, I yeah, think. Does, does anybody have Greg Melee and Leone's latest one, the book? Does, does anybody have that handy? Anyways, I, I'd have to look at that. I'm pretty sure it's. I'm pretty sure it means left, even if even if the text actually says right. But that's an interesting little translation yeah. to, to look into. Um, but anyway, yeah. So this is this is pretty. Um, what we're gonna see, what we're gonna see in the Ninth Remedy Master, is what's gonna inform our understanding of the Eighth. Now, I realize we're doing that out of order, or rather, we're doing it in the order it's presented. We're looking at the 8th, and then we're going to deal with the ninth afterwards. Once we finish the ninth, we're going to come back to the 8th. So don't worry, we're not going to leave it. And the reason why that order works is because, again, the dagger is an addition to our Abrazare material, right? Not a subtraction. So all the Abrazare material that we know Plus extra is what we're working with when we have a dagger in our hand. So, you know, for that reason, it would have been better if Fiori included the ninth remedy master, you know, uh, ahead of the of the eighth in this in this context. But it doesn't matter. We're going to understand it. It'll be perfectly clear once we finish the ninth remedy master. Even though we're leaving that till the end of next week. But we got to keep you guys coming back, right? <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so solid defense, doubled, can do the check stab he mentions, can also um, do that uh, stab in the, in, the, in the hand play that we looked at, and isn't that cool? Okay, um, anything else to say with this? Probably not.
blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay, let's move on. Um, yeah, here we go. So this is the counter um, shocker to the um, to the eighth of Remedy Master, Folio 17 RD. Um, BD, could you give us a read? I'm good at countering the eighth play before me and all his students. I extend my left hand, put it in his elbow, and forcibly push. I'll be able to strike him sideways. As he turns, I can also throw my arm around his neck and strike him in many ways possible. Oh boy. Uh, I think I may have incorrectly referred to this as a check stab earlier. If I did, I, uh, I was, that was an error. The, the check, there's a check stab in the ninth remedy master. I think it's the last play, one of the last plays. But anyway, you could totally check stab with this one too, although of course, right? Because the situation is similar. But um, the here we go. We have a um, we have an elbow push here, right? Although again, interesting, the picture doesn't show him engaging the elbow. It shows him engaging the hand of the dagger. Um, but he says in the text to push his elbow forcefully. So um, if we if we were to say that the text and picture disagree, I think it's clearly the the text that wins out in this one. The spirit of it, anyway, is the pushing the elbow, and that is just to be expected. There's absolutely nothing new or strange here. Makes sense. Makes sense completely. Um, such that I shouldn't dwell on it. Okay. Um, now we have a couple scholars. Okay. So let's get right into these guys. We're gonna read. We're gonna look at them and read both of them first, and then we'll take a bird's eye view of them. So 17 VA. Here's the text. Let's go with um, Bruce. Would you like to read the text for us? Ah, uh, this is a guard and is a strong play, both with and without armor. It's good because it's quick for placing someone in a low bind or a strong key. This is shown with the sixth play of the third master, who plays the reverso side and locks the opponent's right arm with his left. Okay, the sixth play of the third master. Let's go back there. Third master. See, Fiori doesn't even refer... Well, of course, he doesn't refer to him by folio notation, but... Um, sixth play of the third master. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it can't be this one. So he has to be counting this one. One, two, three, four, five, six. So he's referring to the strong lower key in the third master, folio 14 RC, is the image he's referring to here. But, okay, so what is this? So he's covering in more strength. He's covering in more strength. Okay, this is what this is. And he says that um, it's good both in and out of armor. It may seem like it's short, but more strength is not short. Keep in mind, it's not short, so it doesn't suffer from the shortness issue that the crossed plays deal with. And he says it's good because the lower keys come really quick. So isn't that interesting? Um, let's move on to the next one before we stop. Okay, and here, whew, and here's another. Crossed with no dagger against the Sotani. Okay, this is folio 17 VB. Let's get um, Daniel. Would you like to read this one? Daniel, the man. Yes? No? Okay. Maybe he's got audio issues or whatever. Oh! Are you good, Daniel? I see you're unmuted. Silence. You might be having audio issues. Okay, we're going to move on to Dimitri. Nothing personal, Daniel. <laughs> uh, Dimitri, would you like to read this text for us, please? Hello, uh, uh, Dimitri. 
<laughs> do, do you want to read the text for us? I don't think Dimitri's there. He's got oh, a little there... okay. uh, moon uh, next to his. Okay. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. Fine. I will read the text. I can take a hint. Fine. <laughs> this this crossed arm parry is good with and without armor. As the previous student said, my play consists of placing the opponent in a low lock, a low bind, called the strong key, i.e. the sixth play of the third king, who plays with his right hand on the reversal side. This play is done similarly to the first before me, though there are some differences. The counter is to push the elbow. So, you know, um, this cross arm parry is good with and without armor. This is the only thing that's curious. Everything else that makes sense and fits what we should expect, right? Um, yet you you can do low keys. Well, it's a sotano, so there's um, great low keys come from sotanos. That's that's what we're dealing with here. Um, is it similar to the play before? Yes. Um, both your hands are in play. The the lower keys are very come very easily when both your hands are in play here, uh, as long as of course you you've made the cover. Um, the counter is to push the elbow, very obvious. And, um, with respect to now, with respect to crossed or actually wait, let's, let's go back and let's look at the place together. I said, I wanted to do that. So these are the last two plays of the eighth remedy master. Okay. So here are the two scholars. Now, first to note is that we actually have covers that aren't masters. Though I guess we've seen this precedent before with um, more strength in the first Remedy Master. And maybe there's some others. I can't think of them off the top of my head. But so here we go. We have we also have covers against basic attacks that are not themselves masters. The master of this section of the eighth, the eighth Remedy Master is the doubled cover with the dagger. And these guys are scholars of the eighth Remedy Master. So we're still doing stuff that the eighth remedy master can do but we're kind of getting there from different places so we can make a more strength cover or we can make this cross cover now this cross cover we'd expect them to say it's good um oh it's better in armor right and i still suspect that's probably the case however the difference between the crossed cover against the Sotano and the cover against the Fendente or the Mendrito is that the cross cover is not necessarily working against gravity. So is it weaker than, you know, or is, is it stronger? Well, you know, it's a little different. The Sotano is coming kind of up, right? Not only that, because lower keys are your, lower keys are fantastic, right? They're kind of, you know, you'd love to get lower keys from Sotanos. Because of that, you're likely to bleed the force off to your left side with these crossed positions. Even even with the the eight the eighth remedy master, right? Getting inside on the arm of the sotano is uh, is excellent to is an excellent prelude to getting that lower key. And just to, ref to reference the lower key again. The lower key is a little paradoxical in that the entries, and we're going to see a few entries to the lower key in the Ninth Remedy Master, the entries often come from inside the opponent's position rather than being on the outside. On the outside, we have things like the third play of grappling, we got some disarms, we got some arm breaks, we got some all, a bunch of stuff. The lower keys actually come from inside the enemy's position, between their arms, right? But even though they come from inside, they end up in complete isolation. So that's kind of a neat little paradox there, right? Um, but regardless, um, if you get to the outside of the arm with the Sotanos, obviously you have the check stab. That's the easiest, most common thing. Is it is it great? It's perfectly great. No worries. If you get to the inside of the position, you can get into you know in that elbow, and you can you can get yourself a great so a great lower key, and both the more strength cover and the um, crossed cover can get you that lower key. And that's kind of, I think, what he's saying here. All right? Um, and their, their counters are obviously the elbow push. 
Now the the counter to the to the more strength here isn't explicitly an elbow push because it's the it's the the, the main defending arm is the left arm, right? So obviously he can't reach across himself to push the elbow from the right side. Um, so that's why that makes it interesting. But the problem here, of course, is doubling up. Right? The problem against more strength is the double up, not necessarily the elbow push. Um, but yeah, so here's the eighth remedy master. As written, as I said, it's kind of jumping the gun a bit because we'd rather know what the plays are of grappling before we look at what the plays are of dagger. That's how the dagger section has kind of flowed so far. Having said that, we're going to get a bunch of different plays against uh, with the defense of unarmed against the Sultano attack. We're going to get that in the ninth Remedy Master. Then we'll re reflect back on the eighth, tie it all up, and move on. Okay? Sorry. Aaron, I, I just still don't really understand. Please? Like, these last, these last two, they uh, are defenses without a dagger, so why are they in this one and not the ninth? Fantastic question. Um, well, so um, the shorter answer is I don't know. However, in the ninth Remedy Master, the Ninth Remedy Master operates like a, you know, the, the Ninth Remedy Master in many ways is the mirror of the Fourth. So um, just as a, as a bit of a teaser, right, for next week, the Fourth Remedy Master has this cover here where both hands come together at the wrist, despite the drawing, the drawing the hand so low. Both hands come together at the at the wrist to resist the force. The Ninth Remedy Master. Eh, is the opposite or rather it's it's the same thing both both hands come together at the wrist but instead of meeting high they meet low okay and every play in the ninth remedy master follows from the cover right we have a disarm we have a disarm follow-on we have a lower key from the inside we have a lower key from the outside which is crazy bizarre but it's awesome we have a an awesome arm break from a push through we have the one of the most fun plays in the whole manuscript we have the treatment coming up and it's so fun fury shows it twice because he's that much of an asshole but then we have a check stab and we have another disarm and we have some final uh we have a, a counter in the in some commentary okay but to your question why doesn't fury show um show those covers in the ninth remedy master well they could have come in here i suppose Right, the the more strength cover was shown in the first Remedy Master, and that seemed fine. So what the hell, you know? I don't know. Um, I don't know. My instinct is that the Eighth Remedy Master to me seems like, you know, because again, the PD only has eight. The PD the PD has the Ninth Remedy Master as the eighth. The PD doesn't have the Eighth Remedy Master uh, so shown in the Getty. So my personal feeling, having looked at both of them, I don't know, I feel like this was this was added in. You know, already having the material of the Ninth Remedy Master in mind. Not least because if this wasn't in, we wouldn't have a defense against the Sotano with a dagger. So that would be kind of, he'd be remiss to leave it out probably. And he decides to leave these, um, to, to include these here. They don't have a dagger, that's true. Why aren't they in the ninth? Uh, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, they're not, it's not even like, you know, it's not even like they're more like the double defense than they are the actual unarmed uh, ninth master defense, because I definitely don't think that's true. They're, 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 un, they're unarmed defenses, they're, they have more in common with the unarmed defense of the ninth remedy master than per se they do with this master. But Fury's added them in here. You know, yeah. Sorry, I can't give you anything more uh, more useful. I don't know. No, it makes sense. I mean, like, I've certainly written reports. So i got to gotta make this point somewhere, but don't want to ruin the flow of yeah. conclusion. Yeah, you know, and, you know, it's also it's also a, a valid point to, to consider that we don't know how this book was even constituted. Like, we have absolutely no idea, really, how this book ended up being formed. We don't know whether he had the plays in mind first and the commentary followed after, or whether Fury wrote the commentary first and um, you know, and the, um, the 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 plays came after. In fact, and we talked about this in the first class, 
um, that wasn't recorded, but we don't even know if Fiore had a hand in any of these books. We have no idea. The only reason why we think Fiore ha had a hand in these books is because the prefaces apparently say they do, or say he does, and he's writing in the person of Fiore. But we have no idea whether he wrote those preferences. It could have been, it could have, those preferences, uh, the prefaces could have been written before this book, and they could have been added to this book by whoever constituted the book. You know, Fury didn't, Fury did, didn't necessarily have to have anything to do with this book. And by this book, I mean the Getty or the PD, the books we have, not necessarily the effort of making the flower of battle. You know, if we take Fury at his word, if we take the prefaces and their, you know, their common, you know, reasonable context, they probably show that yes, Fiore existed, and yes, he was a guy that probably was more or less like what was described in the prefaces, and probably had more or less the experiences of the guy in the prefaces, and yes, he probably undertook a project to make something like this. But what that project ended up as, who knows? We don't. We have no idea whether or not you know he did it multiple times. Whether or not there was an original that we actually have in our possession. If there wasn't an original, how many down, steps down the line there was? How many different manuscript families there are? You know, one of the reasons why um, the, the the Paris is really interesting is because in many in many cases the images in the Paris look very similar to the images in the PD. Actually, this is a great one to compare because I think this is this makes the point really, uh, really splendidly. So compare the Getty, right? Compare the Getty and the PD to the Paris, right? And here's the Morgan, as a matter of fact, right? And this is yeah, this is this is a great. I'm glad I I'm glad I lucked on this pack. In fact, the Morgan and the Getty seemed very similar, not only in the text and not only because it's uh, it's Italian, it's prose, but the images seem very similar, whereas the PD and the Paris seem very similar to each other, right? So just to make the point, you know, we, we don't even really have a good sense of manuscript families yet. It may very well be that there are several sort of quasi-original books, original being that, you know, books that books that are contemporary to Fiore, whether or not he had a hand in making the original, making the first version of them, we have no idea. But, you know, it's perfectly possible that, say, the Getty, which does in fact seem probably to be contemporaneous with Fiore, and the PD, which also probably seems to be contemporaneous with Fiore, it's perfectly possible that uh, the Morgan and the Paris follow these, you know, the previous two in some way, right? Um, I'm not actually sure whether or not what the scholarship is on whether the Morgan or the Getty is likely first. I have a, I think the Morgan is presumed to be later, but I, I wouldn't bet my life on that. But just to make the point that, you know, uh, it's possible that the Paris follows the PD and there's this, there was the PD or whatever was in the, was the original of where the PD came from. Maybe it was copied a bunch of times and the Paris is the last version of that copy we have. And, you know, same with the Getty and the Morgan. You know, there's all sorts of really interesting academic and, you know, manuscript questions that go uh, uh, that go into this. Um, and with respect to the organization of the Getty, though, how that all ties back, one of the reasons why Emma picked the Getty to mainly focus on, I guess, at least for our recruit curriculum, is because by and large, the Getty follows the rules it sets out and it's organized and it's complete. It doesn't seem to be missing anything um, and whatever. Um, and it's written in prose and it's much, much more explanatory to us modern idiots than the PD is. Um, and, but we don't know it's original, right? And there's still lots of interesting questions about how the manuscript ended up being formed, why certain plays are put in some places and others, whether or not some text is misplaced in some pictures. In fact, we've already seen in the Bastano Cello section, we've already seen text misplaced to pictures, right? The, the text for Folio 8VC belongs with Folio 8VD, and the text for 8VD belongs with 8VC. And isn't that cool, right? 
all this all these little things isn't that cool so um anyway maybe that's a good place to end it all sorts of little interesting questions and as we're about to leave the dagger section um the organization of the book at least temporarily through the sword sections is going to get much much worse <laughs> fury following his own rules is going to get much worse in the sword uh in the sword sections it gets a little better back in armor and then in the mounted section i don't know it might vary a bit more i haven't read the mounted section as much as the other ones but um lots of interesting stuff that we're going to see all right does anybody have any last questions about the sixth seventh or eighth remedy master Oh yes, I'm. I apologize, and I forgot to open up to scholars that were here. So that maybe um, well, we'll use this as a good time. Uh, uh, BD first, and then let's go Andrew, and then is Connor still here? No. Okay, please, scholars, please. Do you have anything to add or subtract? BD here. The uh, uh, looking at the sixth as being similar to the sword and armor uh, appeals to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, which goes back to the one where we were looking at whether it was you were stabbing the hand or blocking with the wrist. That's blocking the wrist almost looks like it's similar to the armored longsword coming up with the sword to the side of the head. I see a similarity between blocking the wrist with the dagger and getting the edge of your sword behind the person's head and throwing them. Uh, that's that's a couple of points. And then um, the other day I was thinking about the difference between the true cross and the bastard cross handedness mm -hmm. and looking at that as for as far as the uh sixth and the seventh remedy master so the mm -hmm. <clears throat> double the double cross that's tenuous but just a couple of comments and of course the whole idea of with the dagger being short enough that you can push the elbow mm -hmm. you do push the elbow mm -hmm. which is basically strato yeah although in interestingly in the sword and armor plays there is an elbow push if i'm not mistaken Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here, 33 VB. So, an elbow push is very common. But yeah, yeah, and there's also a lower key. <laughs> uh, so. One last point with the uh, the earlier dagger block where we are going to the outside, so we're blocking uh, with a boar's tooth to the outside. Uh, that could be a beat, so you could lose contact with the arm, but then you'd have to do it in a fast tempo. So you'd have to beat and then immediately come in and strike. I prefer to suppress myself. Do you mean against? Do you mean the fifth remedy master discussion we were having at the beginning? Even earlier in the Trita, of those brief discussion about the uh, the unusual block. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside. Yeah, the Madrido. Yeah, a beat. You're saying, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, the elbow push to me always evokes the um, shield knock from my thirty-three, one thirty-three. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, I'm, I won't. I won't nail you on that. <laughs> That's no no. Can I tell you something? If you ever if you ever want to see who who are the pedants among you in your current scholarly group, then you just say I thirty three, and you see see who who corrects you. Actually, it's not I thirty three. It's just one thirty three. <laughs> and uh, I see uh, BD was anticipating the pedants there, so very good. It is one thirty three. Hmm. This is being recorded, eh? Yeah, that's right. Is it being recorded? Oh, man. Oh, it's a good thing I'm making, taking very careful account of my language. Uh, just for the record, just for the record, yeah, I yeah. think, yeah. I think yeah, yeah, 133 yeah, yeah, yeah. is the only way. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> all right. All right, the pedants will send me emails, not you. Uh, okay, th thank you very much, BD. Andrew, did you have anything to add? No, I can't really think of anything right now. Uh, Okie dokie. Um, yeah, 6th, 7th, and 8th. I still feel like the skull, like, oh, man, not even the scholars do enough of this shit. We, we rarely get a chance to really do a lot of dagger on dagger stuff. You know, we spend, you know, usually, I mean, I don't know if you guys experience an Emma Guelph, but usually I find that we spend so much time, you know, when we start up, when the scholars start a dagger, uh, uh, you know, a, a, um, series we have to get you know back on our feet again and we have to get our covers again we have to get all our basics again and then we get to the first 
you know, all those first five Remedy Masters. By the time we're at the sixth Remedy Master, we're kind of sick of it already. <laughs> it's already been like three months, four months. And we're like, okay. Play into the sections that I haven't seen before, you know? So. Yeah, like like the, the disarm uh, and the, yeah. In the chat, yeah, the, the stab. Yeah, they, they're fun to do. I think they're, um, I, I think they're, um, they're really fun to do. Um, Emma Gwolf, there's been, I, I think, a couple of years of our uh, provost just yelling from the sideline that we should use our posta mm. when we were doing, when we both had daggers. And we had no clue what he meant. <laughs> and he was very frustrated to find out because he, he meant mm. double up, use your doubled mm. and doubled and crossed postas instead of trying to block with the left hand and then stab. So that's, we, had, we had a learning curve, if you will, until he beat some sense into us. Yeah, same with uh, same with our provost in uh, in Toronto and our free scholars. Lots of beatings and a little sense. Um, yeah, it's it's important to remember that so we've gone through God knows how many plays already. Right, we're almost at the end of the deck section. I can't believe it. It's important to remember um, what we started with, which was if we had to simplify Fiore down to the super simplest elements. Everything we're doing in Fiore can be described as a posta transition. Beginning in a posta, moving through a posta, ending in a posta. And so all um, everything in the dagger section thus far has begun in one of the five dagger postas, has transitioned to other postas, through other postas, and is finished in postas. So no action has been like improvised per se. Even even 11 RD, what we were talking about at the very beginning. Um, even the even this play here. You're you're going um, you're going to post a longa for the deflection, right? And then if you were going to strike, you're going to be striking down. You'd be um, striking to, you know, some sort of boar's tooth or posta longa, depending on how close you were. So, postas, postas, postas. That's why we do them so much. All right, so I think I've taken enough of your guys' time. If there's no other questions or comments, then we'll close the uh, session for tonight here, and we'll resume next week, same bat time, same bat channel, finishing up the dagger section, and starting to move on to the sword stuff. Woo! So, all of you guys have a great night. Be safe. I hope everyone is healthy, and you and your families, and we'll see you here next time. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Mm.